And we see how the mainstream media and the government is able to manipulate a story, take what is actually reality, which is that there were bombs inside the building that did most of the damage, and change it to something else, destroy the crime scene while there were still bodies inside a month after the bombing. They, they, they demolished that building, and there were still a number of people inside, uh, deceased per persons, of course, but they, they were in such a rush that uh, they wouldn't even recover the bodies. Don was there for that. Right, right. Yeah, we did pull the... Uh uh, in fact, we had located uh, one of the female victims uh, that we had to leave inside the building uh, on the night of the 4th. And uh, the building was pretty unstable uh, in that area. Uh, but rather than trying to shore anything up, we were uh, removed. Uh, the building was brought down and we were allowed to go back in the 29th of May and, and uh, research the area and uh, did locate that lady along with uh, one of her female companion workers and another gentleman that had died in the blast. Wow, I know this is hard to talk about. Uh, a lot of key questions we haven't gotten to yet here. Don Browning, retired Oklahoma City police officer, canine rescue handler, uh, was there right after the, one of the first people there on the scene, a former U.S. Marine Vietnam veteran as well. Could you tell us, you've told us about the marshals threatening the police. What about FBI threatening you specifically? Within the, the weeks that followed after the uh, the actual uh, occurrence, uh, FBI agents were assigned to uh, set up a communication station at the uh, Oklahoma City Police Canine and Equine Center. Uh, and they were in and out of our office through the day. Of course, we were supposed to just conduct business as normal, and uh, they were still concluding their investigations. Uh, but was told more than once or twice uh, by agents in the area that uh, people like my wife and I would end up have ended up dead uh, by not going along with what uh, we knew to be true. Yeah. Wow! So you're a, you're a, a, a decorated Vietnam veteran, police officer, uh, one of the heroes that responded when there could have been other bombs and, and it was thought there were other bombs, and the FBI agents in the police office are telling you do what you're told or you and your wife are dead and you're you're saying this on record here sir yes sir P please elaborate for the uh, millions of uh, listeners uh, exactly what happened and if you'd like to name names uh, i'm not afraid of these people um, um as far as names i really don't know i do know there was an agent uh, jim height that uh, had contacted me uh, that was concerned about the health of the dogs uh, right about the same time uh, his story was that uh, the building had been uh, uh, sprayed with a uh, uh, an agent uh, similar to Agent Orange to try to slow decomposition uh, uh, and that there was supposedly was complaints that the odor of the decomp was becoming an issue to, uh, uh, to the surrounding area in the community. Um, <clears throat> again, there were just different things that occurred that just absolutely defied my understanding why they would why they would use something such as Agent Orange uh, uh, without warning uh, of, uh, of what they were doing. Uh, but I mean, I, separately, how did, I mean, did, did, did they phone call you? I mean, uh, did, did an agent in the hall say, hey, you better do what we were told or you and your wife are dead? I mean, I mean, how would they talk to you? No, they were, they were, it was person to person in the hallway. They were in the office there at the Canine Center. So they'd say, do what you're told or you and your wife are dead. Right. And what did you say to that? It wasn't, wasn't too much. I'd say I, I uh, got to yell right. And uh, I, I was not, at that time, was really not in a good mood uh, to hear their crap. I had a major uh, from our department that was telling me that uh, I needed to find new friends, and he thought I was part of the militia. Um, okay, so they're intimidating you, they're isolating you, and then they're, they're threatening you and your wife in a hallway. I mean, I, I just, there's the, it's so unbelievable. You probably had one of the perpetrators right there with you. I, I just, oh my God. Well, I mean, that's, that's one of the things about this. One of the things about this, when you see the behavior of the federal agents on the scene and afterwards, it makes you question what their mission is entirely because they were not responding in a uh, professional manner. They pulled people back to pull off the videotapes. Don, you witnessed that. Yes, I, I watched uh, uh, while we were being sequestered there in the courtyard, I did watch agents uh, with raid ATR, I'm sorry, FBI raid jackets on 
removing cameras from video cameras from the uh, corners of the Murrah building. Tapes that we've never seen. Those cameras would have recorded everything that happened in front of the Murrah building. Mm -hmm. You know, if we are if we are wrong and they want to prove it, you know, if you can show the tape that shows McVeigh getting out of that truck and that truck causing the damage to that building, I'll go home and I'll never talk to you. Well, they've the declared the national security. Some good FBI agents have gone public. As you know, in the L.A. Times nine years ago, and they said they've seen the tapes. There's 20 something of them. And it does show McVeigh with a bunch of other men. And that's why the government doesn't want it released. Exactly. And the, the, own, the Secret Service timeline uh, records that when they looked at the tape, that there were suspects exiting the truck three minutes after it was parked. Plural. That means multiple suspects. But to this day, they insist McVeigh was the only person who drove that truck up. Don Browning mentioned Dana Bradley earlier. Uh, during the trial of McVeigh in Denver, they could only produce one witness who could place McVeigh in Oklahoma City. That was Dana Bradley. She lost her children and her mother and her leg in the bombing. Uh, she gained some notoriety because she was trapped in the rubble and they had to amputate on site. Uh, under cross-examination, she admitted that when she was in the Social Security office waiting in line, she saw that rider truck pull up, Tim McVeigh got out of one side, and a suspect, another man, got out of the other side. Under cross-examination, admitted this. And then the federal prosecutors tried to drag her name through the mud and say that she had misremembered the day, that it was another day that she had lost her entire family and her leg, that she saw that rider truck pull up with two people. It's just ludicrous. And insulting. Unbelievable. Uh, we have Holland Vanden Neuhoff, uh, investigator, filmmaker, and Don Browning, uh, Oklahoma City police officer, U.S. Marine Vietnam veteran, uh, was one of the first to be there. We'll talk about Terrence Yankee and his murder, another police officer that responded on the other side. Folks, I don't like risking my life to expose these people, but we've got to. They're getting ready to do it again. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Oklahoma City's real simple. The ATF even got a rider truck and practiced blowing it up a few months before in New Mexico. That even came out on Discovery Channel. Uh, they were embarrassed that they wanted to get anti-terror funding and laws passed that they've now gotten through, of course, in 93. So they torched Waco. That blew up in their face. And so then they um, carried out Oklahoma City to blame it on domestic groups and on the states' rights movement. And to make Bill Clinton look like a victim, he could demonize talk radio and conservatives. And, and I mean, it was so obvious by their instant response in minutes. It was all scripted. And I remember being in Austin and people were mailing the tapes down and putting them on Access TV. That's why I went down and got an Access TV show in 95, was watching the soap opera every week of the tapes mailed down to Patriots from Oklahoma City and the other Patriots locally putting it on with the bombs coming out of the building and General Parton at press conferences and Hoppy Heidelberg being threatened and, you know, all this stuff going on. And then you find out that so many of these other events have been staged and, and then to have these police officers killed and threatened and, and, and Department of Defense people that were there for bomb disposal threatened. We know where your daughter lives where your daughter goes to school. Again, ladies and gentlemen, you can say, oh, well, I would, you know, punch him in the nose or whatever. But imagine being in a police headquarters and FBI guys come over when you're walking down the hall and say, you and your wife are going to get it if you don't stop what you're doing. I mean, wow. I mean, why would an FBI agent do that unless they were involved? I mean, you're now threatening to kill cops and their wives. That's who runs this government. And the same crew is in charge now. The guy that's the attorney general, he was deputy attorney general then. And in lawsuits, his emails and memos have come out where he's like, April 20th, we got to get to Oklahoma and this is D-Day. These are quotes. And cover this up. Cover what up? Cover what up? Uh, it happened in Oklahoma City. Eric Holder was was in charge of the investigation for the Justice Department. He managed the investigation, later in charge of the Trenton Duke cover-up, now Attorney General of the United States, and now he has Gunwalker all over him. This man has killed thousands of people. That's in the headlines now. Why is it so hard to believe that an operation in 1995 killed 168 people? Uh, yes, sir. That's a good point, uh, Mr. Browning. Um, again, retired Oklahoma City police officer who was one of the first to respond. I mean, that's a false flag staged event right there where they weren't just letting them get sold at gun shops. That was the cover. We now know 18 wheelers into Mexico and in the federal cases, drugs back in. I mean, Eric Holder is just a mob boss. 
Well, you were talking about, uh, you had Hoppy Heidelberg on this show earlier this week. Uh, you were talking about the threats he received. What's interesting about that is that the FBI agent who threatened Hoppy Heidelberg is named John Hursley. John Hursley was basically the FBI's representative to the prosecution during the trial. John Hursley was there with his partner threatening Hoppy Heidelberg with a gun if he kept on talking about what had happened behind closed doors at the grand jury that uh, indicted McVeigh and Nichols and others unknown. John Hursley is now the go-to guy for the History Channel and whoever else wants to do an apology for the official story. John Hursley is there in a suit and tie with the American flag behind him representing the United States government. That man is a thug. He threatens people with guns, and he's on TV trying to explain the official story. In fact, he wrote a book, oh, Ghost, Ghost wrote a book about the bombing, about the official story, and the title is called Simple Truths. Simple Truths, which is always what the noble eye is cloaked in, a simple truth. Uh, Don, uh, what were you looking into that made FBI agents threaten not only you, but to kill your wife? I was trying to follow up. Uh, I had a lot of citizens uh, that was calling, giving information. Uh, they were trying to follow through with with uh, different tidbits of information. I was getting even from uh, persons such as Janie Carverdale and Glenn and uh, Wilbur and his wife. Uh, I felt obligated as a police officer uh, that that we should be looking into all those things, and they were uh, pretty frustrated that that. Uh, for the most part, they were being ignored or or uh, uh, being told it didn't matter. It was it was similar to like um, <clears throat> Dana Bradley uh, uh, we mentioned earlier. I was called into the uh, U.S. Attorney's office and was questioned as to what she said to me the entire time that uh, that I was near her. I wanted to know every if and but, uh, every I, every T. She was groaning. She was in pain. Uh, there was no uh, noticeable conversation that came from her. But they, they were, wanted to know what she'd seen and what she'd told you. Exactly. And there's a woman uh, pinned under giant girders who lost her leg, and, and they're and they're wanting to know what did she say? What did she say? So, as a police officer, you're saying the feds were acting super guilty. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It was. It was. Well, I was told at the time that they they were going to have to repute what she was uh, saying, and apparently she was in she was delirious due to her injuries and and her losses. I bet. You know, she'd lost family members again in there. Uh, incredible. Let's let's talk about Terrence Yegi. Tell us about uh, this gentleman who was one of the first people, along with you, to respond. You know, running into the building that uh, you know had just been uh, 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 devastated. And then what happened to him? Why this is so important? Well, Terry, uh, first off, was was a remarkable young man. He was he was very likable. I did not work with him uh, shoulder to shoulder uh, uh, in our assignments at the police department. However, I did work a lot of extra jobs and uh, security work with him. Uh, uh, not good friends, but friends enough that, especially after the bombing, I would always tease Terry about, "Man, you're my hero." Uh, you know, you you look, you know, you're just you're just my hero. Yeah, well, he made the cover of Newsweek. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because he hauled a lot of people out, right? Yes, sir. And uh, uh, Terry, bless his heart. Uh, Right off the bat, was concerned because there were so many FBI and ATF agents on the scene. Uh, even when he drove up, um, uh, uh, Terrence, when you drive up and there's feds and in, in their gear running around everywhere. What thirty seconds after? Yeah, he he showed up just minutes after. Terrence Hickey was the first officer to respond. He pulls up, and there are FBI agents on scene. The FBI headquarters is is five miles away. They have no business. Why are ATF agents and FBI agents at the scene of the bombing sitting there watching what's going on when the first officer to respond pulls up? Well, they were proud of their work. I mean, uh, <laughs> well, there, w there was an operation going on. Yeah, blowing uh, up some kids in a daycare. That's 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 what tough guys do. Well, Don, you were uh, given privy information about a surveillance operation by the FBI that was going on at the time, right? Uh, concerning the, the vehicle description? Yeah, they always claim yeah, sure. that, uh, yeah. so when it happens, oh, well, it, it was a sting went bad, yeah. Well, well, no, quite interestingly, the um, uh, the morning of the bombing, uh, as I was in, in route downtown, uh, they were simulcasting a, a three-vehicle description uh, along with the uh, uh, 
seven Persian males that were supposedly occupying these vehicles uh, that they had left on the uh, interstate systems from the Murrah building area. And uh, surprisingly, we were told that these vehicles were still under surveillance and uh, continued to The progress. FBI said that? Yes. So the FBI told the police that they were watching the suspects?